Welcome to the Bioptimizer's awesome health podcast. And now here's your host, Wade T. Lightheart. What is awesome health? It's actually an acronym that stands for air, water, exercise, sunshine, optimizers, mental beliefs and attitudes, and education. These are the pillars of peak health, and my team and I have created a free 12-week course that you can use to transform. Each day, you'll get a written and video lesson delivered to your inbox. Everything is covered from the foundations of digestion to advanced alternative therapies few people know about. And again, it's 100% free. Just go to bioptimizers.com. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. Dot com. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Way T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And today we're going to talk about how the perception of health has transformed over the years, particularly how people are planning for living a healthy life into their senior years. And today we have Jonathan Bakhtari, who is an MD who brings over 20 years of clinical administrative and entrepreneurial experience. He has been a triple board certified physician with specialities in internal medicine, pulmonary and critical care medicine. Dr. Bhaktari was formerly the medical director of the Valley Health Systems, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield and Culinary Health Fund. He also served as clinical faculty for several medical schools, including the University of Nevada and Toro University. Currently, Dr. Bhaktari is the CEO of E7 Health and U.S. Drug Test Centers, and he joins us today from his busy schedule in from Nevada. Welcome to the show. Oh, wait, thank you so much for having me. It's a big honor. You know, here's a, we were just talking prior to the show, life expectancy globally in industrialized nations is approximately 82 years It's 76.2 in the United States. I think it was the recent you know, thereabouts you know, mm-hmm. data means that we're six points off the average. And America spends more on quote unquote medical or health, as they call it, than mm-hmm. most of the industrial com- countries all combined. So what that tells me is we have a problem, uh, I think, a public perception about what health is. and obviously, how best we can achieve it. So based, maybe you can talk a little bit about your story's background, and then we can kind of dive into this topic of the perception of health and why it's so critical for our listeners to understand it for themselves, their family and their kids kind of maybe moving forward and, and, and being clear about what's health and what's not health. Because I think there's a real, there's, there's a real, you know, disconnect in the general public about this. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, in the, getting to your point about uh, the United States and the culture here, I, I think obviously uh, we all know, you know, that uh, a big portion of the population is prone to a very sedentary lifestyle and, of course, diet and, you know, fast foods and what have you. I, the more you travel across the globe, you just see, for better or worse, people don't have access to the kind of fast food we have here and the, uh, the obesity and sedentary lifestyle. So I think there's a real need for people like you, for example, in the company, you know, you, you have, and, and, and what we do is to really try to reverse course and, and make a dent in all that. And there, there lies the challenge. So let's talk about the, the starting point and what kind of led you to kind of work on this mission to kind of change this and address. I mean, it's very interesting, both a medical doctor and of course a business executive. And mm-hmm. sometimes those aren't necessarily associated to things. What have you, what do you garnered from maybe both sides of that field? Because you have a unique perspective of maybe how medical doctors look and then maybe how entrepreneurials attack it. And, and mm-hmm. maybe you can say what's the common points and what are the areas of, of difference? Yeah, I, I think as all physicians, you know, we want to help people, you know, in in the broad sense, you know, when we see them, 
Uh, and I think when you're wrapped up in your practice and just, you know, seeing one patient after another, you were trying to do the best you can to help people as they show up. But I think, you know, ha- uh, part of my experience in being a professor working for insurance companies and hospitals and also b- being a clinician, you know, you get, you get a sat- more of a satellite perspective on the problem, if that makes sense. And that satellite problem allows you to look at things in a way uh, that you you realize just treating a problem is not the only way to handle it. it does that make sense? Yeah. So I think, you know, as a clinician, we just see patient after patient and we're trying to, you know, deal with the patients we get. But, you know, um, when you get other experiences like teaching and or working for insurance companies and hospitals, you get a bigger perspective and you realize that there may be other ways to intervene rather than treating people as they show up at your doorstep, uh, right? Because, you know, you could prevent them from being there. That's right. but, but if you're in the trenches... And you got one patient after another. Yes, you can do a two-minute spiel about exercising and weight loss and eating healthy. But that's, you know, yes, it's going to potentially make a dent. But you got to really address it and say, listen, there's a reason why the United States has this problem. The sedentary lifestyle, the easy access, the fast foods, you know, and we have to educate people and say, listen, this kind of lifestyle, you know, can be detrimental and not just when you're sick, but let's talk about it even when you're healthy. Here's a question that I have, and this is an area that I think is where the rubber hits the road. I've thought about this extensively because, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking at how can you solve problems. And I actually took this from the world of investing. Uh, Warren Buffett, I believe, or maybe it was his partner, Charlie Munger, I for- forget which, but he says that every year, they try to calculate for perverse incentives influencing the decision-making of com- companies. And every year they think that they get it figured out. And at the end of the year, they realize they've underestimated to begin. <laughs> I believe that we don't have so much an education problem uh, in the country. There's readily access to information. It is the actual implementation of that information. And so what do, what do I think is, how do we as a population incentivize mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. being healthy? Because right now, I think the incentive is to be unhealthy. For example, you go to your doctor, you get a prescription. Um, your insurance rate is relatively the same as the next guy who's like, for example, mm-hmm. I spend, uh, I was part of, of from Canada originally, and I spent several thousand dollars a month in preventative care health. Mm -hmm. But I played the same tax bracket Mm -hmm. as a guy that was in my building and had a condo Mm -hmm. and he had gone through his 17th surgery. Now I would talk to him. He would be at the Starbucks downstairs eating, Mm -hmm. drinking a triple whatever drink, latte. (laughs) He's having a smoke eating whatever their fast food stuff is. And he's just gone through his 17th abdominal surgery. Right. And he's paying the same tax rate as I am. And in insurance is mm. often, they don't reward this. So I think if we could set up an insurance model that rewards people for better behavior and those models are set up, then I think, um, and, and the practices to get there, I think that's when we're going to see a change. Uh, how do, but how do we get there? Like, as an ins- someone who's been in the insurance side of the yeah, right. what's the obstacles that you see right now in the industry that's not allowing us to integrate what we may know to be healthy lifestyle choices or, or the obstacles of actually implementing this because of the convenience of fast food, because of the ease of, hey, I can get a prescription medication on my program rather than go to see, you know, a holistic right. health. Entity. Yeah, I, I think there's probably not the political will to try to you know, do something like that. In other words, uh, you know, there's social pressures not to discriminate, you know, people based on how much they exercise or lifestyle. I mean, um, but I think another way, instead of like looking at insurance, you, you know, one of the analogies I've brought up many times is look at like your car insurance, right? Your car insurance doesn't pay for gas. Your car insurance, you know, doesn't pay for a tune-up. What's the car insurance for? The car insurance is there for 
you know, something catastrophic happens, you go into an accident, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, people have often proposed that, you know, what happens if health insurance was like that? In other words, you know, for minor visits and stuff, you come out of pocket, which basically they've done by increasing the deductible so high. But the whole idea is if you had to pay for every visit and had a big enough copay, that in a way is doing what you're saying, which is, you know, because now that people have bigger copays and bigger deductibles, theoretically, that should incentivize them to take care of themselves. Uh, perversely, sometimes it has even a worse effect, which they continue the bad lifestyle and they don't seek medical attention because of those copays and what have you. So I think, I mm-hmm. think just it's, the incentive has already been created in the last five or ten years. I don't know if you've noticed, uh, you know, your copay, your deductible. Almost everyone, every plan has gone through the roof. That is in a roundabout way doing what you're suggesting, except it does, it's not having that effect because. You think, well, people have to pay out of pocket for all those prescriptions. You know, they have to pay the first you know, few hundred dollars, the first $25, but it's still, you know, then they just don't take the medicine sometime or they just pay and say, well, that's the cost of having my lifestyle. So I'm not sure just the incentive is working because we, I, in some roundabout way, we've been doing it. Correct. Um, and great point. And I'm new to the U.S. Uh, we just put in uh, health care insurance mm-hmm. uh, recently with our company. And I was just mm-hmm. like, I was like, mm, I don't know if the value here is here yeah. for me, but I'm going to do it anyways. Yeah. Um, um, because of, uh, you know, our staff and some mm-hmm. of the, you know, obviously you want to have catastrophic insurance in the United States. I think medical bankruptcy is one of the biggest bankruptcy uh, issues inside of, you know, you get in a situation or a car mm-hmm. accident or you get into a, a situation where you need a surgery and it becomes exorbitantly mm-hmm. pricey. We want to avoid that. But going back to this preventative health care model, mm-hmm. what I'm suggesting is maybe not more on the insurance side, but maybe on a um, productivity reward based system from mm. on the tax side of the equation because right. lost man hours as a GDP factor and as an individual company, or uh, and then of course, just the quality of life loss. If you can be incentivized, if I can knock off my taxes by percentages because of I've achieved a healthy state of living, then it's a completely different model than if we're going the other direction. So I, I think it needs to be, you know, I think health insurance is seen as something that needs to be, it's kind of like, hey, if you're, I'm not getting health insurance, my, my company's not taking care of me. <laughs> but, but, it, but again, it's kind of like this external responsibility. There's an insurance person, there's a doctor, there's a whatever. I don't necessarily correlate my behavior with a reward benefit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's an adjunct yeah. after as opposed to something I can shoot for, aspire to, right, and have accurate models to say, hey, you know, like what Peter Atia is doing. Peter Atia is talking about, okay, you know, you want to be in the top two and a half percentile of cardiovascular health uh, each de- of the decade before you to kind of plan on living a healthy lifestyle overall. And I think you could right. probably do correlations on bone mass and muscle mm-hmm. tissue and maybe there's a band within blood sugar regulation mm-hmm. that it seems to be superior over time that you could correlate over lot large populations i don't know what what do you think as a as a medical doctor not yeah uh, you know I, it's funny you should say uh, the way you said it i mean how you treat your bodies in your 30s and 40s often correlates very highly with what happens in the 50s and 60s and you know uh, us physicians see this uh, all the time so this idea that you know, you you take care of yourself now to you know have a healthier lifestyle when you really need it is is proven science, and we just have to get people to understand that. It's easy when you're 30 or 40; kind of doesn't really matter if you're in bad shape. You're not going to feel the consequences for another decade or two, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. So, how do how, how do you look at this as as a medical doctor as an entrepreneur? So what 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 do, what, what we have done at E7. Mm-hmm. health is we look at the barriers for people to get access. I mean, truthfully, even beyond what we're talking about, you know, right now, if you call your primary care doctor, you said you're new to the 
U.S. health insurance. But as soon as you get the, you know, the phone number for your primary care doctor and you try to give them a jingle for your first appointment, you'll be inundated, you know, like the phone system will start off, thank you for calling, press number one if you're a new patient, press number two if you're an old patient, press number three if you want medical records, press number four if you have a billing issue. And then you press that, and then it gives you three more options. Press if you, you know, need an appointment. Uh, press if you want to speak to some, and you go through five prompts, and then it, then the prompt because unfortunately no one is here to answer your question. Leave a message, and somebody will get back to you in 24, 48 hours. Then somebody calls you back, and you're in a meeting. You miss that call, and and then you know somehow you eventually get a hold of someone, and they tell you the first appointment is eight weeks away. Okay, so that's really. Mm-hmm. You, you know, that's putting you know look at your products if i had to buy your products and but i had i had to go through five websites and you know multiple codes and whatever i mean the the more barriers you put yes between someone getting what they need so what we decided to do at e7 is we decided to really replicate the amazon model for healthcare i mean how many clicks does it take for you to by a battery on Amazon. I mean, like two clicks and, and, and it's in your front door two days later, or a day later. You know, why isn't healthcare like that? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, why can't you be two clicks away from getting uh, your, your a prostate exam? Or why can't you be two clicks away from, you know, getting your cholesterol checked or what have you? And and so th- this was really the, the, I thought the ingenious idea of creating E7 Health was to, and now we have a new company called e national testing e national testing.com where literally you can in three clicks you know get a cholesterol test at uh you know thousands of locations across the united states in all 50 states literally it's as easy get ordering a cholesterol test on e national testing is faster than getting uh you know a battery on Amazon. And that it took us 10 years of really software development, technology, partnerships, vendor management to develop this. And we just think that aside from all the issues we talked about earlier, you know, what are the oh, barriers to getting the things that you do want? Let's say you really are out of shape, but you really want to right. get a physical, you want to get a test, you want to that's daunting. So I it think really a lot of people, a lot of people just say, you know what, never mind, you know, I'm just moving on. And so I, I think like anything else, you know, um, Amazon went from just selling books to selling everything because people said, oh my gosh, it takes two clicks and I can buy a book. So when they started offering something else, they're like, oh, and so, you know, you have to, you don't have to load your credit card, you know, that you don't have to put your address yeah. in. Yeah. The one click policy just was awesome. Right. And and so we thought that's what's missing in healthcare, that you're really? not one you're not one click away from, you know, getting your um cancer screening or your allergy testing. It's, it's I'm being so excited about that because uh, I mean you make a great point. Every barrier creates a problem. So what you're addressing as an entrepreneur is eliminating the transactional barrier of going through a dog and pony show and extending the time that you just lose interest into removing those barriers. So, um, so people can take action kind of when the, you know, they feel a pain in their chest or they look in the mirror, they have that moment where they're in a decision-making opponent, they can make a decision and take Mm -hmm. action and start building momentum in a different direction. Right. It's so interesting. What, um, Many years ago, my family bought a gym, a health club. And one of the things I learned from, you know, trying to put that business together is that when when people come in for a new gym membership, uh, one of the things that we learned is there's always, always a trigger that brought him into the gym. Always. Yes. You, you know, uh, and it, and if you if you spend time to get to know them, you you often they'll tell you the trigger. You know, uh, you know, I, I had one lady say said to me, you know, I'm a grandma and 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 uh, my grandchildren try to sit on my lap and they they just commented, grandma, there's no place for me to sit on your lap, you know, because she was so big and that crushed her. And, you know, that little thing or, you know, somebody is coming, uh, tried on an old favorite, you know, jeans that they love and boom, it just and that that 
because they love this pair of jeans so much. So, so it's this, when you get now, if they came and the gym was closed and they had to come back two weeks later, the trigger is gone. Yeah. Right. I mean, you got to get them when, 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 you know, or the emotional they're, they're, energy is kind of high and they're ready to do something right now to make that decision. Right. You know, the girlfriend just broke up with them last night, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that's right. I'm hitting the gym. They go knock on the gym. The gym's closed. Oh, you know, they'll be open in two days. You know, it's just you got to you got to get them when it really matters because people will talk themselves out of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so I think this removing barriers. So when people act like you were suggesting, when they really need it, they're ready to go. And, you know, again, at e-national testing, we said, you know, what well, let's. Let's contract out with, you know, 5,000 labs in every state. And if anybody needs anything, boom, boom, boom. You know, we have doctors in all 50 states that are licensed in all 50 states that can write the prescription and do follow up if necessary. So we just said, you know, why don't we just, why don't we just create a system where people can have access to what they need? So just go into that, for example. So let's, let's walk through an experiment. Um, Let's say that I want a fasting glucose you know mm-hmm. i want a fasting glucose test i want to look at a lipid profile of yeah the vascular risk uh, i want to do a hormone test yeah to see where my hormonal balance is going to be yeah. um and i'm gonna i'm gonna go look for it and i'm gonna click on your company what 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 happens when i jump on there what goes on well, yeah well first of all i can tell you in the time it took you to tell me that you could have ordered it that's great. I love it. So what and, are the... and, and you would have had a requisition to go to a lab probably a half a mile from where you're currently sitting. That's so cool. I can't tell you how cool that is that, yeah. that that's available to people because right now in the, you know, the area that we have a lot of focus, the biohacking space, mm-hmm. um, you know, most of us listen to podcasts. We're listening mm-hmm. to the experts in the, in, in the industry and we listen to a podcast and they talk about some nuance and you've mm-hmm. got to look for this, this, and this, and this is the test that you might need. And you go, right. Do I go for that? Yeah, you can yeah. literally click on your site, get the test booked, you know, as you're listening to the podcast, right? And have an appointment in a relatively reasonable amount. No, you could w- go straight there, walk in, it'll be drawn. And the next day or two days, depending what lab you order, it'll be in your portal. That's awesome. That's that's uh that's a breakthrough technology. Yeah, just when you get a chance, just check it out, enationaltesting.com. And literally, we have tried to replicate Amazon. I hope Amazon's not listening because I don't want them to think we stole all their ideas. But we just we just knew that if if you can buy a book that easily, why can't you take care of yourself that easily? I love it. So what are the kind of so how many tests do you have available on the site? Oh, I mean we have um, you know cardiovascular we have a men's health package a women's health package we've got drug testing employee testing uh, wellness testing allergy testing std testing um all a few clicks away wow uh that's extraordinary now as a medical doctor let's say somebody's listening to this podcast they're like okay i'm 50 years old um you know i i, I want to look at you know living my best life on the second half what what are some tests that you think that they want to start with that, that hey these are some things that you really need to monitor moving forward on a preventative side to catch something before it gets too sideways yeah so i mean so the basic stuff is still the basic stuff you can't get away with it people get so exotic well you need this this and you know just get a complete blood count get a a, a comprehensive metabolic panel uh you know a psa certainly at that age yeah, uh, potentially, uh, you know, uh, a full lipid profile. I think that's a great starting point because, you, you know, can something fall through the cracks? But 90% of stuff that can be caught uh, in a, in blood testing will be somewhere in there. Often just, even if it doesn't tell you that's the problem, something will be off that will trigger additional testing from right. your primary care doctor that will then hopefully get you the right path. But of course, going for a physical, there's no substitute for that. So I would just say, you know, getting your yearly physical colonoscopies, 
you know, every five years or so, depending on what age you're at. Uh, but even now we have fecal testing, where, which is a good good substitute if you can't go in, but you should try to go in, number one. Um, so I think, yeah, just getting your annual physical, getting your blood work, um, uh, depending on your age group. If you're a woman, of course, we're talking about pelvic exams, you know, pap smears and um, uh, mammograms based on uh, one or two years, depending on your age. Uh, these are all things that, you know, can really save your life, really, really save your life. Great stuff. Um, good information. So I want to bring full around um, to where we started, because I'm not sure if we got into the testing side of it, which is so cool. And I think mm-hmm. that's that's great. But what about the perception of health? How do, how do you see that it's transformed? Um, like, how would you define health? And now for a Bioptimizer's Fixed Digestion Tip, supercharge your protein shake. Everyone knows protein shakes are a great way to sneak in extra protein, build more muscle, even replace meals and burn more fat. The problem is the highest quality protein typically absorbs at around 40%. One way to fix this and dramatically increase how quickly and effective your protein shake digests is to add two to three capsules of masszymes into your shake. One research study showed that pre-digested protein during a meal increased muscle growth significantly. To take advantage of this, just blend the open capsules into your shake and within 15 minutes or less, the enzymes will have begun to break down the protein into amino acids. This can make your shakes at least two to three times more potent. Some people do this and sip on their shake while lifting to provide their muscles with a steady stream of amino acids during their workout. To save 10% on masszymes, use the code SHAKE10, that's S-H-A-K-E-1-0, at masszymes.com. That's SHAKE10 at masszymes.com. Well, obviously, you know, the the, the one big criteria of health is your BMI. You know, your BMI tells a lot about where you are in terms of your metabolic situation. So if you're, you know, if your BMI is under 20 and you know, maybe or lower, I, you know, I think you're, you're in the right track, of course, then your cardiovascular health, you know, how much, you know, your, your maximal heart rate, and, you know, can you can you go 20, 30 minutes, uh, you know, be, and be aerobic, anaerobic, and, and still be in, you know, be able to tolerate it. So I think aerobic shape, and your BMI are two really good indicators of where you are. Now, for someone like myself, um, mm-hmm. who's, uh, been lifting weights for a long time, including cardiovascular mm-hmm. health. My BMI is going to be in the high twenties mm-hmm. as opposed to standard, even though my body fat percentage would be sub 12% all the time. And sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, a sub 10 mm-hmm. uh, with a cardiovascular output of, of an elite athlete at 20 years old. Wow. That's great. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at those markers. So, With the BMI, how do you break that down a little bit? Because BMI doesn't always indicate that ratio between body mass and body fat levels. Yeah, yeah. But again, you're the outlier. I'm talking about for your, I mean, we're not, you know, you would be in a, you know, when you get trained athletes and stuff, that's a separate thing. What I was referring to is just your overall, your your average Joe walking off the street. I think just without keeping it too, too complicated, you know, Obviously, you you know what your ideal weight is. I mean, you know, most people can figure that out from any chart. And of course, you know, making sure your percent body fat, like you're suggesting, you know, is not you know super high is going to determine how much belly fat, how much visceral fat you have. All of these things will have a negative impact if if the numbers are uh, too high. So. Um, I think that's the general thing. You know, just make sure your 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 percent body fat, you know, is like you. Well, you're an elite athlete, but you know, below you know fifteen percent, twenty percent, and really try to get to BMI, you know, under twenty for the general population. Okay. And and I think that's a good target. But uh, elite athletes, of course, are, are in a class by themselves. Now, what about? Um, some other areas, because let's look at our, we've got four big killers out there. We've got Mm -hmm. heart disease, cancer, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. diabetes, and then uh, medical air, (laughs) usually treating the other three things and something Mm -hmm. goes wrong and 
you get contraindicated or they have a bad outcome for a surgery or whatever happens. So how do we offset those things from a, maybe a testing procedure, like particularly around, you know, high blood sugars correlate it with diabetes. And mm -hmm. also I think it's pretty conclusive that high blood sugar diets are really not that, uh, or probably lead to increases likelihood in cancer as well, which are one of the big killers and also for cardiovascular uh, health. So what tests would you recommend around those particular areas to start see where you're at so you start course correcting a little sooner? As yeah, well. yeah. I mean, the one thing, um, I mean, the most simplest thing, although, you know, we can do glucose intolerance testing and all that stuff, but clearly for a healthy person, your blood sugar should never really be above 100 for any reason. Mm -hmm. You know, postprandial, whatever, it should never be above 100 no matter what happens to you. So if you see you're getting a blood test, certainly fasting it should never be above 100. And mm -hmm. and even if w with eating a meals, if it's you know getting close to 100 or if it crosses 100, you should probably get a full you know evaluation because you may be pre-diabetic at that point. Right. So that so just even getting you know a lot of times we give these complicated things. Go get a glucose intolerance. It's, I get that, but simple things start you know is the way to start. Just Get your blood sugar, and if it's in, you know getting near a hundred, you know you probably need some further evaluation. So that just keep it simple, you yeah. know, and just just go in and get your blood sugar done. Uh, if you're fasting, it should be way below a hundred, and if you just ate, it shouldn't be more than a hundred. You know, maybe shouldn't even be more than ninety five or ninety. But if you're approaching that hundred mark, if you're one hundred and twenty, you're probably pre diabetic. Mm. And, and, and there's no getting around that probably and, and it's a raging issue uh, going mm -hmm. on in the population definitely correlated with fast food consumption the inflammatory effects you know i always say inflammation is the silent silent killer mm -hmm. it's happening from all these things but you don't necessarily feel it or notice it but we're we're continually rusting away <laughs> right uh, from oxidative damage. what other things around health or the perception of health, do you think that we can do a better job of addressing? Uh, you know, I, I think stress, I think people uh, minimize the, the how stress can impact your health, your cortisol level and, and, and how you manage stress. I think a lot of people, you know, especially, you know, um, if they're highly driven, you know, they just think, oh, I can, you know, just keep piloting on, keep piloting on. Yeah. Yeah, I'll you know take, take five more projects on, start two more companies, and da da da. And I and I think you you can't be in denial that you know part of your health has to do with you know uh, how much you give your brain and body a break here and there, take vacations, you know, meditate, pray, um, you know, have hobbies, and uh, you know, take care of your stress level. Uh, I think stress and diet and uh, exercise or, or lack of exercise are probably those three are pick up, make up 90% of it. Mm -hmm. So what do you see happening um, overall in kind of health in the United States and the world in general? We're obviously we're trending in, I think it's really a death spiral that's going on. If you look statistically Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening over the last few decades here in North America. What do you think is going to cause a reversal of this or how do we change this or how do we move forward on this? Or can we, or is, is it impossible yeah, to do an individual? I, what's, what's, well, I think the, if you, um, to, to answer that question, you have to say, what is the, the root of the problem? Why, yes. why, why is healthcare different? Well, you know, why, why is it that we're making advances in cell phone technology and, you know, how to order, how to get food delivered to you with Uber Eats. And, you know, we've improved everything, but we, why are we not? And I think the big elephant in the room for why healthcare is such a problem is it's not a transaction between two parties. It's often a transaction between three parties. Four par if I wanted to buy one of your products, but I had to call my cousin Vinny to get his approval. Mm hmm between me being on your website and trying to order it and then calling my cousin Vinny and saying, what do you, then he's got five questions for me. It's not a simple transaction between two people. There's an insurance company that's involved, you know, their medical director, and then 
you know, your copay and the pharmacy is getting involved. They don't carry that. They do carry. It's not formulary. It's formulary. And, uh, you know, uh, that doctor is no longer on your panel. It's not a, tr- a transaction between two parties. It's, I always joke, it's like going to dinner on a date and having the chef and the waiter sit at the table and join the conversation. It's not going to be the same. <laughs> It's, it's not it's not going to be the same conversation when you have so many people at the table and I think that's a hindrance uh because we compare it to all these other industries but none of those other industries have five people who are stakeholders around these decisions yeah yeah I mean you're talking- I don't know if you I don't know if you ever thought of it like that but uh, it, it, no I have never actually thought of it that way but I experienced it that way, that I have felt the uh, pressures, particularly of that system. And it's very similar in Canada. Canada mm-hmm. has public- More so. Yeah, it's more so. And, and what I came to conclude early on in my career coming out of university and then you know studying health and working in every edge of the field is that the system as it currently is was not supportive of my health. If I followed that system, um, I wasn't going to get where I wanted to go. So I started learning different methodologies, Mm -hmm. different uh, mechanisms Mm -hmm. in order to do that. But I always was frustrated from the standpoint is this is my career. This is my industry. So I Mm -hmm. have time, the energy, the effort, the motivation, the drive, the, all of those things are stacked in my favor to go out and sort out these things on myself. Someone who's got a busy lifestyle, maybe they're a single parent or even two parents with a bunch of kids and the pressure of their work and they don't have any backgrounds in this, they're stuck. They don't, they're stuck in the barriers, which the, the time pressures and alone is huge. So this is a great step on the national testing what happens after the testing then have you noticed with people who are using your platforms do they they tend to start making progress in the right directions have you been able to track that or do you have any data on that you know i think when we uh talk with them i think one thing we notice is i think people are more likely to take action because they get results i think prior to that it just i think people gave up you know they won't get their cholesterol test that's right. Because, because, I mean, just the book, the appointment is a Herculean you know, task. You know, I, again, I, I defy anyone right now to pick up their phone and call their primary care office and see the massive telephone prompt that they have to go through. There's no one just picking up the phone and say, hi, this is so-and-so medical clinic. How can we help you? And that, you know, not to harp on this, but that, no other business could survive doing that. I mean, your no. business could. Your, your business. No. How long would you in business we if you had be. a if you had a ten minute prompt with multiple punch in punch in? If someone had to go through that, would you even be in business tomorrow? No. And, but yet, but how is it that they can survive? Other than they have a captured audience who's got no choice, and their medical plan says you got to go to this doctor, and that's it. And it doesn't really matter even if they find another, it's going to be the same thing. So they're sending you a message. People who who start who have a business and make incoming calls go through 10, 15 prompts, they're screaming from the top of a mountain. We're in control. Yes. That's that's very well said. Do you from the medical side, as medical doctors in general? Um, Mm -hmm. because I I want to kind of dive into the psychology also of the doctors that are out there. And you touched on it earlier. Is this a frustration point for the medical establishment itself, or are they oblivious to this? Well, again, this is another elephant in the room that you should be aware of. Uh, Back 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 24, 75% of doctors were in private practice for themselves. They ran their own, it it was their business. Right now, that's 24%. That means 75, wow. 75% of doctors are employees. Holy cow. That's a, that's a, that might be the most stunning statistic I've heard in health in, in maybe the last year. 
So you're saying literally it's a complete inversion. We've went from, mm-hmm. so, so there's a, that's a, that's a, a three X swing. That's a hundred percent, three, like 25% to 75%. Why was that? Do you think? Be- a lot of it was healthcare consolidation, you know, um, equity firms have now started buying hospitals. They're buying medical practices. Um, look, I mean, look, 10, 15 years ago, there was 12, 15 airlines in the United States. Now there's three, maybe. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, there was like um, t- 10 cellular phone companies. Now there's three. You know, when the equity firms get in, the consolidation, Wall Street, you know, and, you know, just it's so- consolidation, airline consolidation, cell phone consolidation, healthcare consolidation. And what's interesting is the quality goes in the same direction. Right. I mean, uh, all of a sudden the airlines start charging per bags. And this would have never happened when there was a 10, 12 airlines. Now that there's three. So with a wink and a nod, they say, hey, let's charge for bags, you know, and let's don't worry if we don't leave on time. Who cares? There's only three of us anyway. Same thing. I defy you to call one of the, your cellular phone companies. 45 minute wait, an hour wait. That would have never happened 10 years ago. So what? So as the cellular industry consolidated, as the airline industry consolidated, what happened to service? What happened to quality? We, we, okay, so what do you think is happening right now? Right, totally makes sense. Totally. Right, I mean, so much sense. I mean, right now, if you your doctor is probably owned by a healthcare system, which is you know a conglomerate. And your doctor is just clocking in and out and, and getting a paycheck. Now that doesn't mean doctors don't love their patients, and yeah. and and want everything. I, you know, er, almost every doctor I've ever met is there for the right reason. Mm-hmm. So it's, I'm not saying it's anything to do with the doctors. The system is now been consolidated, and big money has come in and taken over. Uh, even where you are, you know. The, the, most a couple of the universities have bought up almost every practice in in Southern California. Uh, so um, it is what it is. What do you suspect is going to happen over the next twenty years? Um, in I the- don't know. I, I see. I don't know. If frustrations enough because look, people in oh. Canada are putting up with it. People in, in in England are putting up with it. Yes, a few people leave, but. You know, I, I think just, they just like grin and bear and say, you know, uh, we're just, you know, healthcare is going to become this again. Now we're we're like a small salmon swimming upstream, trying to change the course, you know, with our e- e-national testing and other products that we hope to roll out. But uh, you know, are there enough of us to you know turn the tide? You know, I hope so, but um, it's it's a challenge. It's a really a challenge. I, it, it's, it is a monumental challenge. It's something I think about a lot. Um, my business partner and I were very passionate about, you know, how do you live long and live strong? And what's the ironic part is we've never had uh, better technology to probably improve the quality of life. We see, we do see this downward trend. And you're suggesting, if I heard you correctly, that a lot of this is is because of the, the conglomeration of these options that's driving down competition, which usually leads to better service. And then it's all just like a turn turnkey operation that's been set. And the individual has a very difficult, well, you, essentially no options inside of that top down, uh, you know, union dimensional, you know, 1984 model of, mm-hmm. of, you know, like the Apple commercial, like, you know, that whole thing you know, has become a reality now, you know, we're, we're stuck within this, but there's always these people on the outliers. What do you see happening for you guys in the future? Because you're, you know, it seems like you're a serial entrepreneur and that you've got mm-hmm. some ideas that you want to address. What are some of the other things that you guys are currently looking at bringing on board with your platforms? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we want to add more uh, of a virtual component to, to our testing so you can, you know, get, get the testing and a virtual access. You know, one of the things we opted to do is not be involved in insurance, which I know is a challenge for some people, but we really, you know, re- really work on very thin margins. 
Yep. And and so super affordable. I mean, if you go to enationaltesting.com, uh, you'll be surprised at, at how how relatively inexpensive it is. And so we just thought, you know what? If we made it super affordable, would people be willing to, uh, you know, avoid all the hassles and just go ahead and get what they need when they need it? And are they willing to, you know, obviously pay a little more because when you think of your copay and you think of the hours of waiting in the waiting room, the clipboard you got to fill out, all of that, there's cost and time associated with that. So yep. our goal to see is, you know, are willing are, are people willing to pay a little extra? And you're in that same business. Are people willing to pay a premium for their health? Uh, and we've tried to make it super affordable, of course. Yeah. And in fact, that's essentially how I survived the Canadian uh, medical system and then moved down here to the United States a number of years ago as I, I just operated outside of that. And, uh, you know, because mm -hmm. the, the opportunity cost lost mm -hmm. in, uh, in all these kind of bureaucratic or really large regimented system wasn't worth it. And I would tend to go to the private practice or someone who was a little bit more informative and a little bit more nimble. And, uh, you know, could, you know, I want I want to be out doing things. I don't want to be out like you said, <laughs> burning, burning the clock with nothing. Like, I get so frustrated. I was, you know, I was uh, talking about the airlines. I was flying in from, uh, we have a research facility in, in Bosnia. And I was flying back yesterday. It was basically about 24 hours and I got stuck in Denver. And mm -hmm. uh, it was a, you know, it was, it was a little bit messy. And I, I remember I was thinking this exact question, you know, like, it wasn't like this before. You yeah, know. but there was two, there was twelve airlines. Yeah, exactly, it was just wasn't like this because and, you know you got if you got mad at American, you were like that's it. I'm never flying these guys, and they would feel it. Now, as many people who swear they're never flying American, there's the same number of people saying I'll never fly United. Correct. And there's the same number of people saying I'll never fly Delta, and they you know and they're like okay, well we'll just trade all those people, and yes. we're no we're no worse off. So we'll keep doing what we're doing. Well, that's what I was thinking about because I've literally had that conversation with myself with three different airlines. Right. I'll never fly with these guys again. And then I go right. to the next one. It's the same thing. And I'm like, well, I'll and, never fly uh, with these guys. And I'm stuck in that. Well, well I, I hope no one from the airline industry is listening, but I can comfortably tell you they don't care. Yes. They don't care. What do you see... Um, from a regulatory standpoint coming down. Um, obviously we went through probably the biggest globally coordinated uh, political medical intervention over the last couple of years. And now the evidence is, is certainly coming out that, that there was some really bad science that was propagated and affected a lot of people, affected the world. And we're, we're, we're now paying the economic cost. Mm -hmm. Do you think that public perception is now more aware of the bureaucratic problems and maybe more motivated to, to, to set in motion a different plan? Yeah, I think so. Well, I, I don't know if there will be a different plan. I, look, before COVID, I think people thought uh, like of the CDC as, you know, as just unimpeachable authority and, you know, just they were the you know cats meow and what they said and and to a certain extent that's true i think they had some missed opportunities and and uh you know could could they have done it better of course I, you know i remember i had launched my podcast bakhtari md right at the beginning of COVID, literally and so you know i remember like as i was doing these COVID episodes you know and people were you know, I was sort of addressing all these questions, mask, vaccine, da, da, da. and you could see how to, it, as long as you were just looking at the science, it was very clear. And what wasn't clear to, to everybody who had all the facts is, is was escaping me. I mean, it was clear to me that the main people at risk were the people at risk, right? The people who had multiple risk factors, the elderly <clears throat> So instead of locking down the whole society, we should have just locked down that group and, and took care of them. I mean, like in a mm -hmm. good way, right? I mean, the people at risk, you know, and the whole economy didn't have to come to a screeching halt as long as we protected the people at risk. 
you know, 10, 15 year olds that were not at risk. You know, their teachers who were 60 years old were at risk or who had risk factors. So we don't have to close down the schools. We just have to, you know, take those teachers, you know, out of the environment, protect them, pay them, whatever it took, but still, you know, have schools keep going, you know, have the economy still going. That was clear to everybody, I think, you know, how it got to where it did. Um, you know, it was just uh, a little unfortunate. Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, I was on a plane coming in the other day from Germany, and uh, they were still, you know, were, you know, asking about COVID stuff. And I was just like, "Is this is this really for mm-hmm. real?" Like, like <laughs> <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was like, "Wow, this this bureaucracy moves really slow." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well once something becomes uh, bureaucratic regulation, you know, regulations rarely, if ever, like disappear you just keep adding. so true it's so true and we do seem to be kind of becoming paralyzed through regulation i just got word the fda has now really put out an extremely draconian um messaging around uh, marketing and advertising and things like that is going to be present a whole host of challenges and legal consequences out there, particularly managing what other people say about your brand and, you know, peer reviewed journal, like it's, it's going to get pretty, it's going to get even mm-hmm. messy up there. And you see this in other industries at some point, is it going to change? Is it going to become efficient? Is it going to get worse? Or what do we, what do we need to do as the individual to protect ourselves moving forward and make better decisions? You know, I, I, I think people have to understand there's the consequences to just pe- putting regulation after regulation. Look, at some point, we do want to protect society. Nobody wants yes. unregulated products. Nobody wants, you know, we, we want our meat inspected, of course, and we do. And I, and I think the question is, you know, how do we get all that? How do we get the protection we need without just creating regulation for the sake of regulation and to... Just you know, have some bureaucrats just sit in an office somewhere, come up with stuff. So, uh, I, yeah, I think people just have to get fed up enough because we you know, we want the planes to be safe. You know, we don't want any shortcuts. We want the meat to be safe. You know, we we do want that. We want our medications to be safe, and you know, we want that. And the question is, how do we find the balance mm-hmm. between getting that stuff? You can't just like do everything in this in name of safety. Well, we 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 want you to be right. safe, so we're going to keep piling on regulation for yeah, car for, driving. Yeah. If car if cars were invented today, no one would have a license. Yes, like yeah. I think I think in so and like the car is so conducive to kind of Americana society. I mean, it, mm. it, American and the car is kind of like the symbol of the ultimate mm. level of freedom. Right, and we allow sixteen-year-olds to drive cars, <laughs> <laughs> which I find ironic. Right, um, and like I said, if it was out today, we wouldn't we wouldn't have no. access to cars. And I think most people like their car, but there is an inherent risk um, with cars. And so, how do you balance that? Um, it's a good question, and I don't I don't necessarily have the answer to it. Yeah, you know, I'm supposed to be the guest. I'm supposed to give you give you the answer, but you yeah, know, sometimes sometimes. You know, from where I sit, the only thing we can do is, you know, more people, you know, like our company and other people like us just need to be putting out products. And, you know, the only way we were able to separate ourselves is, you know, to kind of step away from the third party insurance. Because if we had to stick with that, we, our technology, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. I mean, it just wouldn't yeah. work. So, you know, I think the challenge becomes you have to almost be part of the problem or part of the solution. You can't, you can't, there's no middle road to change the solution as it currently sits. So if I heard you collect you've, you've come to the similar conclusion that I have is that your healthcare is your personal responsibility mm-hmm. and you want to, you're going to, it's going to cost you a bit more on the dollar side uh, mm-hmm. in order to, take things in your own hand. However, the opportunity cost of mm-hmm. not doing it lost is probably more than what you're going to pay as a premium 
uh, yeah. to get this done. And just the time efficiency of what you're advocating right now, what you just told mm-hmm. us about your site. If you think about in terms of work hours, you got a 40 hour workout and it's going to take you burn you all this time. And then you have the lost, you know, preemptively getting addressed about some condition is often a, a better likelihood of a, a positive outcome if it's a significant condition that you have. Plus, you have the peace of mind, the reduction of stress, the the fact that you've simplified getting the essential tests that you need to monitor and protect yourself for for, for health or, or even to reward yourself for behaviors that are leading to good health and creating a model that works over time so that mm-hmm. you can see if there's any distinct changes seems to be the answer. So it seems like you're, it's, it's almost like a libertarian approach to, <laughs> uh, to like, it, we just have to take full responsibility yeah. for health and, and it's going to cost us a little bit more, but it's probably going to extend our life certainly improve the quality of our life and reduce the risk better than if we're caught inside the bureaucratic system. Yeah, I, I agree. Of course, you know, I mean, <clears throat> well, I agree with that. I mean, and you could do both simultaneously because there's no substitute for not getting your physical and seeing your doctor, but she should be doing that too. But, you know, simultaneously, you have this other route to at least get some of the testing done <clears throat> while you're waiting to see your doctor or while you're waiting for your physical and, you know, eventually, um, you know, if we can add the virtual visits to our website, that will address some of that. But having contact with the healthcare provider is still very important. We are just doing our part to be on the menu as as things that can address the problem. It, it's it's very exciting. I'm, I'm happy to do that. So can you tell everybody uh, where's your website, maybe follow you, your podcast, your yes. and what you're putting out there, because we need entrepreneurs like yourself getting that word out to the world that, hey, look, um, a lot of our listeners are very proactive. We all know mm-hmm. the obstacles that you have in getting testing. This is a quick and easy, fast way to do it. Simple, mm-hmm. effective, and Give us the give us the details. Where do we oh, go? Sure, How sure, do we sure. follow you? How do we learn more? Uh, okay, so the website is enationaltesting.com, just the letter e nationaltesting.com. And you can see the whole panel of everything we offer. In terms of following our podcast, Bakhtari MD, <clears throat> we're on YouTube, Spotify. That's B-A-K-T-A-R-I-M-D. We're just launching our second season in the next few weeks. Um, as well as you can follow me on LinkedIn. And then also we have a website, BakhtariMD.com, which has all my national interviews, my blogs, uh, as well as the podcast. And ev- all the content is curated that we put, uh, that we have in all the different other medias. They're there, all our national interviews and different uh, podcasts and stuff that we've done. So everything's on BakhtariMD. Of course, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn, uh, I'm, I'm certainly available and, and I and I respond to that personally. So those are all kind of good ways to work with us and reach us. Well, Dr. Bakhtari, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, we'll have all the links in the show notes of the podcast. Any final words to our listeners before we uh, sign off? Yeah, I mean, I would tell people in terms of taking ownership of your health, you know, it's only you, you, you know, we, we can bring it all the technology, we can make it easy. But you know, what I tell my patients uh, is just you have you at some point, you just have to take ownership, it's yours, it belongs to you. And nobody else can own it like you can. So just take ownership. Well, thanks so much for providing the service and taking uh, being on the podcast today. And for all our listeners, listen to the podcast. If you like this podcast, give a like, give a share, and uh, share it with your friends, share it with your family members, show them how easy it is to get these tests that they may not be getting. Um, you know, I've maybe have elderly parents that are resistant to it. Maybe you have a family member to it. Go on site, have that conversation with them and book through the website, get that test going. It just might save someone you love. So thanks so much for joining us today. I'm A.T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers. This is the Awesome Health Podcast. We'll see you on the next episode. And now for a Bioptimizers fixed digestion tip, how to get away with eating sugar. Hey, look, sugar is normally one of the worst things for you, but let's be honest. I mean, we all cheat from time to time. And here's a little trick that will ensure your body benefits from the sugar. Now, before you eat or drink anything sweet, take five to eight capsules of P3OM. The patented strain in the formula devours sugar 
so fast, it literally doubles in the body every 20 minutes in the presence of sugar. That doesn't mean that you can or you should eat a bunch of sugar or sit around all day doing that. But on the days that you do cheat or you go and go after one of those maybe meals that you wouldn't normally do, this ensures that you get something in your gut that eats the sugar. And it's not going to feed the bad guys or spike your blood glucose nearly as much. So to learn more about P3M and its sugar devouring and protein digesting properties and how it can transform your gut and metabolism go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.